Well, good evening, everybody. When you're back there, you don't hear what the uh, what Kayla had to say, so I'm not exactly sure whether it was good, bad, or indifferent. Um, but thank you very much, and thank you very much, Dean Rutherford, for inviting me, and a special thanks to uh, Nikolai de Pipa, who uh, hosted me this afternoon, and I think is responsible for managing this particular uh, uh, speaker series, so thank you very much. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here. Um, I bring you greetings. Uh, from your northern cousins in Minneapolis, the Hubert Humphrey um, School of Public Affairs, where I've had the pleasure of being on the board for a number of years. Um, as you know, today is the 11th anniversary of 9-11, and it's forever etched in my memory. Um, and those of us who lived through that terrible day, I'm sure we'll all remember it. Um, I was at Ground Zero shortly after um, the planes uh, attacked those towers and saw the rubble being excavated. And I was there in New York City last Friday at a meeting at Goldman Sachs, which is right across the street uh, from Ground Zero. And this time, there was an enormous amount of uh, activity. The Freedom Tower, the large building that's going up, other buildings that are being built, the uh, visitor center, as well as other pieces of art. And I just thought that it really is a metaphor for what makes our country great. And that is, we can get knocked down, and we certainly have, but we always get back up. We persevere as a nation, even though the world and the nation we live in is always changing providing new opportunities for sure, and posing great challenges. As many of you know, we're up against a world where the resources that society has to dictate to the social ills that we face are shrinking. The economy is slowly recovering from recession, but government funding for social programs in this country, everywhere in this country, is likely to continue to decline. Now, why is that? Well, the primary reason is rising health care costs. We have an aging population. I'm responsible for part of that myself, I admit it. And the cost of health care continues to grow above the cost of inflation. So what is the impact of that? That means that discretionary spending Things like the higher education system, the University of Arkansas, for example, system, the University of Minnesota system, University of Michigan system, early childhood education, workforce development, anti-poverty programs of all kinds, support of the arts, and in Minnesota, the most important thing, fixing potholes, is getting cut. And will get, continue to be cut for the next 20 years if trends persist. The infuriating thing is that these discretionary programs don't just do good. They're often sound long-term investments for society with a high financial payoff. These programs are the preventive medicine for our social ills. We can't afford to have preventative programs weaken in this country. We need our social programs to become better they need to become more effective, we need to extend their reach, and they need to serve more people in need. I believe that we can do better. I believe that we can build nonprofits and social enterprises that are more effective and more powerful at addressing our social ills. We can find innovative ways of funding these organizations. Funding can be based not just on the social good they accomplish, but the economic value that they provide, the value in cold, hard cash that they bring to society. We can do all of this, but not if we keep doing things the same way. We need to renew and improve our social organizations in this country. We need to take the best thinking of our for-profit sector and marry it with the best ideas in the nonprofit sector. 
That's not to turn nonprofits into for profits. That's a bad idea. But to build higher performing social organizations that do more with less. That's what I'm passionate about, and that's why I wrote my book. The non nonprofit focuses, as Kayla mentioned, on seven principles that are exemplified by the best for profit organizations in the world and the best nonprofit organizations as well. They came from years of experience observing what works and what doesn't. I've lived and worked in both the for profit and nonprofit worlds. I spent 22 years at General Mills. I launched a product called Yo Play Yogurt, which became famous when Johnny Carson, the former host of The Tonight Show, quipped, there's a new kind of, yo a new kind of yogurt, it's called For Play. <laughs> I've served on numerous corporate and nonprofit boards, and 18 years ago I founded Twin Cities Rise, which seeks to end concentrated multi-generational poverty by providing employers with skilled, reliable employees, primarily men from communities of color. Since it was founded in 1994, Twin Cities Rise has grown from a pilot of 19 individuals who we didn't treat very well because we didn't know what we were doing, to an organization that serves over a thousand people each year. I refine the principles through interviews for this book. I talk to the CEOs of large organizations like Habitat for Humanity, smaller social enterprises like Lumni, which sells mutual funds to investors and uses the proceeds to pay for poor kids' college costs here in this country and in South America as well, and Playworks, which provides coaches for elementary school recesses which teach conflict resolution skills. Based on all that, I define seven principles that can build higher performing nonprofits. And I'll just mention to, them, mention to uh, them now, and then I'm gonna go into more depth. The first one is to have a clear and appropriate purpose. You don't have to um, uh, take notes, particularly if you wanna buy my book. <laughs> um, to have a clear and appropriate purpose. The second is to measure what counts. Third, to be market driven. That always gets quizzical looks by some. To create mutual accountability. To support personal empowerment. To create economic value from social benefit. And to be learning driven. So at the end of this talk, my hope is that you gain at least one idea. Just one idea. That's all I can hope for. One way that you can look at your organization differently. One new way of doing things that you can start implementing tomorrow. <clears throat> and based on my experience with the exemplary organizations, some of which I mentioned, I know that an important idea lies there for you. So the first principle is to have a clear and appropriate purpose. Obviously, the idea of purpose doesn't just belong to organizations. How many of you have ever heard of Harmon Killebrew, a great baseball player who played in Minnesota? I didn't think I'd get all the hands in Arkansas, but he was a great baseball player, a wonderful man who died not long ago. He used to tell the story about his family. He said, my father used to play uh, with my brother and me in the yard. Mother would come out and say, you're tearing up the grass. And Kilbrew's dad would reply, we're not raising grass, we're raising boys. It's a cute story, but it makes an important point. Purpose answers the question, why are we here? Are we raising grass or kids? Purpose is why an organization exists. It expresses the passion that brings social entrepreneurs and nonprofit employees to their work. A clear and appropriate purpose inspires, it guides, it energizes all those associated with the organization. Now why focus on purpose and mission when talking to nonprofits? After all, organizations that tackle our greatest social problems know why they exist, right? Because the best organizations do more than know their purpose. They hold themselves accountable 
to that purpose in everything they do. They focus their efforts and resources on what will accomplish that purpose and also what will not. To hold ourselves account accountable, we need not only a purpose but a clearly defined mission. Mission defines the aspect of the problem that one's organization chooses to tackle. For example, at Twin Cities Rise, our purpose is to reduce concentrated multi-generational poverty. Our mission is to provide employers with skilled workers, primarily men of color, who once lived in generational poverty. Our purpose drives not only our mission, but also the way we measure progress and the way we communicate our results. Now, others may have different words for describing purpose and mission, but the important thing is not the exact terminology, but the concepts and the distinction between purpose and mission. Too many organizations, for-profit and non-profit, get sidetracked from their original intent, and it's easy to get pulled off track. There's the tyranny of grant money. Are any of you in non-profit organizations? Do you know what I'm speaking of? There are bills to pay, and there's, an available, there's available money from the government or from a philanthropist, but it's not especially well aligned with what your purpose and mission is. Do you go after it or don't you? And what are the consequences if you do? Or your clients need so much more than your program can provide them. You want to help. You want them to succeed, and suddenly you're diverting resources to build yet another program. Are you being synergistic, or are you diluting your efforts? Great organizations refine their missions and as they grow and learn as conditions in the world change, but their purpose remains inviolate. Measure what counts. Metrics have a way of focusing our attention whether it's the ROI of a Fortune 500 company or the SAT scores of a prospective college student. It's human nature to spend our time, our energy, and material resources on those things that are being measured. So it's critical to measure what counts. Organizations get what they measure. What counts is the long-term outcome, the real-world results that you need to achieve your mission and fulfill your purpose. Getting a person into a minimum wage job may be an improvement, but does it significantly affect chronic concentrated poverty? At Twin Cities Rise, we don't think so. So the outcome we focus on is the number of participants who get and keep a job that has a salary of at least $20,000 a year with health benefits. It's critical to make a distinction between inputs outputs and outcomes, inputs like the number of clients you serve or the number of courses they take or the number of hours that are in training, outputs like the number who graduate or the proportion who land a job, outcomes though, the number who get and keep a living wage job with benefits for at least two years, something that has social consequences to them and to the rest of us as well. It's a little like my old company, General Mills, measuring the amount of wheat it buys, which is an input, or the amount of cereal it produces each year, which is an output, instead of focusing on how many boxes of Wheaties it sells to customers, an outcome. The temptation to measure inputs and outputs exists because they're easier to measure, they're less expensive to measure, and funders often ask for those numbers. But it's only by measuring what counts, the long-term outcomes that achieve your mission, that we can know if we are truly making progress toward fulfilling our purpose. Number three, be market-driven. Whatever your organization is dedicated to, you have a lot of stakeholders, clients, donors, government employees, their government and employees, all of whom require your attention. They're all important, they all have needs. But to be market driven, you have to determine who your customer is. And interestingly enough, 
It may not be the people that your organization is dedicated to serve, your clients. Your customer is the one stakeholder group who more than anyone else determines your survival and your success as an organization. In the case of Twin Cities Rise, our customer is the employer. Our programs must meet the needs of employers or our participants won't be hired and certainly not retained. It's as simple as that. Obviously, we don't ignore other stakeholders, but we pay a special attention to the needs of employers. Now, I'm always challenged on this when I speak to nonprofit groups. How can you talk about being market driven? You're a nonprofit organization. And I tell them the story of Willie Sutton. Some of you have probably heard of Willie Sutton, if you're my age or older, that is. Willie Sutton was a infamous bank robber of the 1920s. And when he was asked, Willie, why do you rob banks? He said, well, that's where the money is. So our, the employer is our customer because that's where the jobs are. So the critical question is, who is your customer? Think about all your stakeholders, all the groups that influence you in accomplishing your mission, all the groups whose needs you take into consideration in your work, and all the groups that you benefit. Which group's behavior is absolutely critical to achieving your specific outcomes? Number four, create mutual accountability. When everybody has skin in the game, you're more likely to win the game, aren't you? Successful organizations practice mutual accountability. Now, how many of you have um, either swung a hammer, painted a building, or hung sheetrock for Habitat for Humanity? A fair number of people. Well, did you know that new Habitat homeowners are required to put in hundreds, sometimes thousands of hours of work on their own and other houses before they move into their own house. Habitat believes that this policy of sweat equity has many benefits. Recipients become partners with the people who help them build their house. They work side by side with members of their new community and become part of it. And donors cite it as the reason they like to donate to Habitat. One reason why it's so important that participants pr practice mutual accountability is that mutual accountability is the natural part of a productive life in families, between spouses. You pick up the kids from soccer practice, I'll take care of the groceries. Or in teams at work, everybody has to be rowing in the same direction. In the case of Twin Cities Rise, participants often come from a culture of generational poverty with beliefs and behaviors that does not serve them well in the world of work. We have a written contract with participants that establishes the value of the training they're receiving and the consequences of not fulfilling it. Successful organizations practice mutual accountability with all their stakeholders. Successful nonprofits are particularly careful to be clear and specific about the mutual accountability they expect from their clients. So ask yourself, do your clients understand the accountability due to your, to your program? Or do they think of it as an entitlement? Number five, support personal empowerment. Now the principles all work together. I hope you're starting to see that. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to hold off in talking about empowerment until we get to the last principle, being learning driven. Empowerment is the most important thing that we had to learn about to make Twin Cities Rise successful. So let me skip to number six, to create economic value from social benefit. When society supports social purpose organizations, it's not just doing what's right, it's doing what's smart. Because every improvement in social good has economic value. Now let me say that again. Every improvement in social good has economic value to someone. We are used to thinking about improving social outcomes as a moral imperative, but it's also smart fiscal 
policy and I forgot to turn off my phone. Sorry about that. I hope it wasn't a donor. Uh, so we're used to thinking about improving social outcomes as a moral imperative, aren't we? But it's also smart fiscal policy. Doing good is worth cold, hard cash to someone, either to the participant, the state, the federal government, or any host of other stakeholders. Now, how does that work? First, we need objective economic analysis of the financial benefits of the social outcomes that we're trying to achieve. In Minnesota, I worked with state economists to determine that every participant whose income increases from at least $10,000, their number, to at least $20,000, brings an average economic benefit to the state of $31,000. It comes from two sources, increased tax revenue. When somebody's income goes up, they pay more in income taxes and sales taxes to the state, to the federal government as well, and a decrease in expenses, public subsidies for the most part. As incomes go up, they use less in the way of low-income child care, low-income health care, low-income housing, and uh, federal subsidies like uh, food stamps and the like. And direct costs for things like incarceration, for example. This e economic analysis has enabled us to negotiate a pay-for-performance contract with the state of Minnesota, where Twin Cities Rise is paid a portion of these benefits, a portion of the $31,000, but only for its successful graduates. We take the risk. If somebody doesn't get to $20,000, we get nothing. And only for those graduates who get a job and then keep it for at least a year. Since 1997, when this program was enacted, the state has earned $36 million in benefits and paid out less than $6 million in cash. That's a seven to one return. But we can go one step further when we create economic value from social outcomes because Every improvement in social outcomes leads to economic value. And economic value is the same thing as cash. It's no different than the cash created when a, a business, small business, large business, sells more product or makes it cheaper. It has the exact same value. You may have heard, how many of you heard about the social impact investing, the social impact bond? Some of you have. Probably the students, right? No? Um, well, what we have is a great interest around the world now in what is called social impact investing. Um, and there are two, two models that have emerged. One is called the social impact bond. It started in the UK, where a pilot is now underway, and where the intention of the pilot is to reduce recidivism of prisoners in the UK. That has economic value to the Department of Justice in the UK for obvious reasons. Fewer prisoners mean less incarceration costs and other costs. To the extent they can be measured, captured, they can be rewarded. And on that basis, they went to philanthropic investors like the Rockefeller Foundation and others and got seed money to invest in this. There are other programs that are just getting underway in this country. One just got underway in New York City, also to reduce recidivism of juveniles at Rikers Island in New York City. The state of Massachusetts is looking at a social impact kind of bond uh, as well. In Minnesota, uh, the organization I started, in Invest in Outcomes, has developed an alternative approach called the Human Capital Performance Bond, uh, the acronym of which is HUCAP not hiccup, and we have been successful in passing into statute uh, a law that would establish a pilot program and the sale of $10 million of bonds to finance it. Both of these things are called bonds, but the social impact bond is not a bond. The people at Goldman Sachs call it the social impact non-bond, as a matter of fact. It's more like a social venture capital investment. 
But in fact, the, state, the, the investment in Minnesota is a bond, just like any bond that the state of Arkansas would sell, the state of Minnesota sell, every state sells them. And what is attractive to us about it is that it brings in market rate investors, banks, uh, insurance companies, other financial institutions, private investors, and there are a lot of market rate investors and you can keep the cost of capital low. And it works in both cases because the incremental taxes that are created by the social intervention and the decreases in public subsidies and direct costs are greater than the cost to the government of borrowing the money and paying it back. And so there's no tax money used. The benefits, if these things work, and they are pilots, is that this would provide incremental investment to social enterprises, to nonprofits, at a time when government is cutting them back. And the money will go only to the highest social performers, which is a, an attractive way to ensure that investment is spent where it's treated best socially. And furthermore, it will allow nonprofits to invest more strategically. When they get a grant from the government, they usually have two years to show an, out, an output. They don't have time to show an outcome. And so they make decisions that allow them to show something within two years, often not the most strategic uh, use of the money. But a bond is 10 years in length, at least. And so with that, they have the opportunity to invest it in a way that gets a higher return over time. Creating economic value from social benefit comes down to some pretty basic questions. <coughs> Excuse me. In what ways does your organization create economic value? Every nonprofit should know that. Do you produce services that have monetary value to you and your stakeholders, particularly governments, the county, the city, the state, the federal government, they're all stakeholders in this. What are the bottom line outcomes that quantify your social benefit to those stakeholders? When you know those things, you can begin to think about pay for performance contracts and innovative forms of funding like social impact investing. That's the power of creating economic value from social benefit and we need it if we're going to maintain a healthy social enterprise system in our country. Be learning driven. <coughs> um, individuals don't get it right the first time, nor do organizations. Or sometimes the second, or even the third. But they persist, and they keep learning. And if you want your organization to thrive, you have to build a learning-driven organization. Now, why is that? Well, because assumptions don't always pan out. And there are always unintended consequences and unforeseen events. The economy, natural disaster, and even opportunities that you didn't consider. So you have to build a working model. You have to experiment, evaluate, adjust, experiment again, reevaluate, and so on until you get it right, until you hit the target where you need to hit the target. When I started Twin Cities Rise, our initial program had three components, excuse me. Remedial education, skills training, and a behavioral component. What many people call soft skills training, you know, dress for success, get to work on time, don't argue with your coworkers, certainly don't get into a fight with your supervisor. <laughs> but we had too many dropouts during the program and even after they graduated and went to a job. We realized that we had to learn a lot about the culture of generational poverty. Individuals who are raised in this culture of generational poverty frequently feel victimized, powerless, and entitled. As our participants grew up, they learned a whole set of beliefs thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that enable them to live in that culture, survival skills that have now become counterproductive, not deferring gratification, blaming others for their misfortune, fleeing or fighting, but not negotiating. We learned, and we learned it the hard way, 
For change to endure, people must transform themselves. This is true of all of us, every human being. To stop feeling powerless and start taking responsibility. To stop feeling hopeless about their future and start seeing better possibilities within their grasp. But this takes a belief-centered model, not a behavioral one that we had been using. It's more than a feeling of confidence that people acquire from completing something. It's a particular set of cognitive and emotional skills coupled with a positive belief system. Using this, these skills, a person can manage their emotions, thinking, and behavior to achieve positive long-term goals that behaviorally oriented soft skills training simply cannot. So we consulted with a psychologist and we developed training in what we call personal empowerment. Every participant is assigned to an empowerment coach. Empowerment training is part of the participant's curriculum. They take classes in learning about empowerment intellectually. It's part of our culture. Its language is spoken in every class. Core value to be lovable, valuable, and important. The basic tenets of being a human being. Core hurt, those things that interfere with your core value that you were told as early as a very young child. Being in a power mode where you feel that you can do what you need to do to get it done. Or a weak mode when you say, I can't. Empowerment coaching continues through the first year or two of employment, very vulnerable, vulnerable times. And as a result, our graduation and persistence rates shot up. We have had, since 1995, 82% one-year retention in jobs and 72% two-year retention in jobs that averaged $25,000 a year, an increase of $20,000 since the individual started the program. If we hadn't been learning driven, we'd still be pounding away trying to drive soft skills training into people who simply weren't equipped to sustain it. Too many organizations still are. You have to build an enduring culture if you're learning a culture through organizational processes like regular lessons learned sessions, ongoing research, and intelligence gathering, and important cultural messages. Everything is subject to change if change can improve what we do. If it doesn't work, do it differently. If it can be improved, do it differently. Make change intelligently, gather information, experiment, evaluate the results, and adjust. To build a learning culture, ask yourself questions like, how do we learn from what is and what isn't working? What systems do we have in place? for harvesting internal and external intelligence. Every nonprofit should expect to go through significant re-engineering during its lifetime. The key is to have a learning culture that helps you make the best use of your resources as you grow and thrive and adapt. Now the seven principles aren't theoretical constructs. They aren't some vision of how the world should be in the future. And we need them not because we're bad at what we do or even ineffective. Many of us really do good work, but, we, but because we passionately want to do better and we need to do better. They'll enable us to build on what we've already established, to get better results, to build a stronger organization, to develop smarter strategies, to take advantage of opportunities as they arise, and to find innovative ways to fund our efforts. Most important, they enable us to make greater inroads towards fulfilling our purpose. So think about what most resonated with you in the talk today and what you could do first thing tomorrow morning to start making it happen. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. If you would raise your hands and please wait for the microphone to get to you. Right here. All right. Here's a microphone. 
Hello. My name is Alex Mitchell. I'm a Clinton School student. And my question is, what do you feel about social business being incorporated part as nonprofit and as an incorporation like an LLC3? Yeah, I, you know, my definition of a social enterprise, uh, and people argue about this, I mean, some academics argue, uh, spend a lot of time writing about it, but I, I, my belief is that social enterprises can be non-profits or for-profits, and I think the LLC3 is like the low-profit corporation that is being considered, if I have that right. It's, yeah, you get all the benefits of the non-profit as a business. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's something called the Low Profit Corporation that was on the ballot initiative in California earlier this year. I think it's passed in Michigan and perhaps Vermont. It really hasn't taken off, um, and I can't tell you why. But, you know, I think that there are wonderful uh, for-profit organizations that do great work socially. Some of them do it quietly. It's not their main business, so you don't hear about it. Um, when I was at General Mills, I chaired a joint venture between a very large operating foundation called the Weiler Foundation and General Mills. And we brought together, and this is where some of the ideas for my book came, we brought financial strength and um, some business acumen, and they brought knowledge of the uh, elder, um, basically nursing homes and elder care. And we put together and designed a new kind of alternative to the nursing home, which ultimately was sold to something called Sunrise Communities, and they built them all over the, the country. We, got a, we weren't looking for a profit. We were looking for a return of our capital so we could reinvest in another social activity, and that's what happened. So I think uh, corporations do it in different ways, and I, I, I think it's... Immaterial. Quite frankly, I was uh, talking to Nicola before. I said, you know, if every nonprofit could make a profit, I'd be fine with that. Then they could finance themselves. So I don't, I don't think this is a matter of uh, ethics or morality. It's, uh, but the fact is that many things won't cash flow. But we need them anyway. So we need to support them. They just have to find new ways to support it. I was on the board, still am on the board of American Public Media, which owns the largest. Um, uh, national or public radio system, Minnesota Public Radio and others. And um, any of you listen to Garrison Keeler, the Prairie Home Companion? Okay, well, years ago, when he was still local, he, um, he, he announced on the air, without telling any of the managers, that anybody who wrote in and asked for a powder milk biscuit um, poster, they'd send one to and they expected 1,000, they got 10,000 requests. And this was a small radio station that thought it was going to go belly up trying to provide these things. So somebody had the brilliant idea of saying, well, we have to honor this request. We'll put another little sheet in there that says, for sale, mugs, t-shirts, hats, out of which a $200 million business emerged, all owned by the nonprofit. So there was a perfect example, unfortunately not duplicated, a sense of a nonprofit that created a for-profit business which it owned entirely, ultimately sold to the Target Corporation for $135 million and provided the, the endowment that allowed Minnesota Public Radio to grow. Yes, sir, right here. Wave the microphone. Let's come. Your, your reasoning is compelling, and uh, it's a good line of thinking. Why don't we hear more of this? Why don't nonprofits put that foot forward? Because, in, particularly in these unstable times, the need for them to, it is to me as compelling as it ever has been. Yeah, it's a good question. Did you all hear it? Why, why don't we hear more of this? Um, um, I'd like to say there aren't as many brilliant people around, but that's not the answer. Um, no, the, I think the answer is, is, is the same. It's about human nature. And that is, whether you're in business or nonprofits, people behave the same way. You don't change what you know best until you don't have any choice. And people still have choices, reluctantly. Um, but smart nonprofits recognize what happens. Smart philanthropists are recognizing this. The government is recognizing it. The Department of Labor just issued for the first time ever a pay-for-performance contract, $20 million, competitive, 
So instead of just providing a grant to workforce programs, now you're going to have to demonstrate that you performed at some level based on social value equating to economic benefit. This is the beginning. And um, I think, you know, uh, necess necessity is the mother of invention. This is what's going to happen. I, I think this is going to steamroll. Three years ago, never heard, no one ever heard of a social impact bond. There was no human capital performance bond. There wasn't any interest. Now it's the hottest thing. Unfortunately, people are, are jumping on it before they understand it, and they could, um, they could kill it, too. That's the other problem. You get an idea that seems interesting, and everybody thinks they understand and start to implement it before they really understand it, and we throw the baby out with the bathwater. But I, I think it's, uh, this is, this is a, um, a need that is n not going to go away. The, the, the cuts at the federal and the state level are with us for at least 20 years. And uh, in my state of Minnesota, the, economic, the, uh, the, the economists have estimated that um, health care costs are going to go from 30 percent of the state budget approaching 60 percent of the state budget in 25 years. Now, if that happens, there's nothing left for anything but K through 12 education, nothing for the higher ed system, nothing for early childhood, nothing for anything else. And that same trend is happening here in Arkansas and in Texas and in California and everywhere else in the country. So people are going to be desperate for new, for looking for different things. I want to add to your perspective, and I want to applaud Dr. Rothschild for actually doing what he did. The way he was able to, the way I see that you were able to apply these business principles in a nonprofit is you left a very lucrative career in business and you asserted it into a social need. And so I really do see where you had the expertise and you had the passion behind it to drive the social change. So uh, for that. Thank I you. Well, the truth is I left my career because I was an executive vice president of General Mills. I'd been there for a while. I was 45 years old. I wanted to be the CEO and the CEO didn't want to leave. So, <laughs> so I left and I was going to start a business and I wound up starting a nonprofit instead. Georgia, right back here. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait for the mic. I'm Georgia Miartin, and I run a program for working homeless people here in Little Rock. And so I have both a question and a comment. I'm sort of remarking on your encore career, if you will. I was interested to know kind of what advice you have to all of us in the field about how we can recruit people like you um, who have that business expertise to come and serve on our boards in an engaged way where, where they can kind of plug in that thinking. Secondarily, I wanted to offer up a resource which we've become aware of in the Institute for Government here in Little Rock at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. They are doing exactly what you just spoke about. They're doing an impact, an economic impact analysis for us about the value of our, child, of our children's programs over the life of a homeless child, what that looks like when we invest in homeless children early on and how, how that has an economic impact. So the UALR Institute of Government um, is offering that to nonprofits now. Um, well, I go to the highest bidder, so if you, you make me an offer, um, if it was only so simple. Ah, thank you. No. You can negotiate your business deal I, after the question. You know, I... I which I, is fine. I, I want to make it clear. I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that business has all the answers, or even most of the answers, or that every business person thinks about this in the right way. Because we have people coming to our doorstep who have business careers who want to volunteer, and some of them come in and they want to turn us into a business. So they want to spend their time looking at our balance sheet and our income statement, and just like they did when they were in the business world. We don't need them for that. We want them to apply their thinking skills, if they have good ones, um, to help us think in creative ways. And so I think it's less you know, about that this person has experience and more about what the, how they've used it and how they can apply it in a different way and recognize that it's a combination of putting together your best thinking with, with other thinking that can make things better, not trying to uh, turn you into a business. I don't think that's the right way to go at all. And I think that many business people who have tried that and have gone to nonprofits have, have felt a, a, haven't enjoyed it as much. Um, for that reason, I, I, I just know that from personal experience. Yes, sir, we have a question right back here. 
Yes. Uh, sort of a follow-up to the question about why aren't we hearing more about this, and you probably do this in your book, but what are you including under the term nonprofits? The nonprofit landscape in this country is huge, literally, and it, it includes the Cancer Society to the neighborhood organization to the Boys and Girls Club, et cetera, et cetera. Are you making a blanket application of all nonprofits, or are you selecting, are some more prepared and more likely to do this, better equipped than others? Well, uh, good question. I, I would submit that these principles apply to any organization, and even for-profit businesses. My focus was on nonprofits, but this would apply to the Cancer Society or the Garden Club, any organization. I mean, principles, principles, to be a principle, they should be pretty universal. And I mean, if you don't have a clear and articulate purpose, if you're not measuring what counts so you know whether you're on the road to achieving that purpose, um, if you don't understand who your customer is, whatever you call them, and therefore directing your resources in such a way that you can help your clients best, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you're really not going to be successful regardless of whether you're the Cancer Society or, um, or the Garden Club or General Mills for that matter. It's all, it's fundamentally the same kind of thinking. Um, and the best organizations like Habitat for Humanity apply these things extraordinarily well. Uh, Lumni, which I mentioned, um, Caring Bridge, which some of you may be uh, aware of, which provides, uh, you know, sites for, for uh, so relatives and friends can follow ill um, friends and relatives. That, that's actually um, started in Minneapolis. Um, so, I mean, this, I think this is fairly universal stuff. I mean, I, I started doing this stuff when I was in, at General Mills. I didn't start this when I was in the, in the um, and I think the best companies, if I think about what are the best run companies, if you talk to their employees, if you go out and talk to Apple employees, they know why they're there. They know what their purpose is. If you read Steve, the, the book on Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson, I mean, he was focused on purpose all the time. Everybody knew that, and therefore they could f see how they fit in and what, what their degrees of freedom were. If, you don't, if, if employees don't know why they're there, and uh, then they work on anything, and pretty soon you have a lot of gobbledygook, and that's what happens to poorly run organizations, whether they're for profit or non profit. Ma'am, you had a question right back there. Yes, ma'am. Coming to you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Maxine Allen, and uh, I'm the director of the Wesley Foundation at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock a faith-based uh, ministry directed at students. Uh, you talked about uh, funders and outcomes. Uh, the problem that we see is that funders want immediate outcomes where dealing with students, uh, as you spoke about the bonds, there may be a 10-year uh, outcome uh, trajectory. So how do we convince funders uh, to allow us to have that 10-year trajectory? Yeah, they have to think more like, um like an investor. How, how many of you have 401k plans or invest at all? When you invest in something, um, you're, you're probably not investing for 60 days from now or 90 days or most of your portfolios and stuff that you're looking for something down the line. It could be a bond, it could be a stock. And in fact, foundations have their corpus invested in that way. And so they think long term. Um, except when it comes in some cases to how they're investing uh, money in social enterprise. Um, part of it is we don't have the objective tools, we don't have the transparency, and we don't have the know-how in foundations or government to do this well yet. In other words, right now, if you're measuring an output, it's pretty easy to measure an output. You know, how many people graduated? How many people got a job? You don't have to do much more with that. And quite frankly, there's not much of accountability either on anybody's part. But if you say, whatever happened to that person two or three day, years down the road, that takes a bunch of follow-up. And then if you try to monetize and say, what did that mean in terms of higher taxes and lower subsidies so we can measure it across and compare this program to that program, much like you would between two stocks, that just takes more know-how 
more accountability, and that's going to take a while. But the power of doing this would enable foundations and government and individual uh, philanthropists, people here who are giving money to charity, to be able to actually see what the results are that you can't care about. Uh, many people get tired of giving their money away because they say, I can't tell whether it did any good. So they stop. We have that happen. We, we need to provide tools that exist that allow that to happen. Well, you have the opportunity now to uh, purchase the non nonprofit and to visit with Steve as he signs your book. Let's, uh, let's thank Steve for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.